great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, Andrew, right? right. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did my PhD in Galatians um, at the University of St. Andrews, which is in Scotland, uh, with N.T. Wright. It was a blast. He's a, he's a great, um, great guy, great scholar. And um, my focus was on um, Paul's theology of suffering as represented in Galatians. That's not a topic that people normally talk about when they talk about Galatians, and that's part, part of the reason why I wanted to do it, both to like demonstrate that it, it is actually a pretty uh, prominent theme and that it, it, I think, helps make sense of certain aspects of the letter. Um, and, and so that, that's kind of like the main, the main reason why I wanted to do it. The, the argument that I made in, in a nutshell, sort of like the elevator version, would be that um, Galatians is all about circumcision. Do these Gentiles need to get circumcised or not? The male ones, obviously. Do they need to get circumcised or not? Um, given that that's the Jewish context and this is a Jewish movement. So do they need to follow suit? Do they need to follow all sorts of other Jewish customs? And what I argue is that there's uh, a number of strands of evidence that suggest that the uh, Galatians aren't merely uh, sort of theoretically thinking about the matter of being circumcised, but there's actually more pressure upon the community to get circumcised. And that's creating a lot of turmoil in the community and a lot of uh, angst and divisions. And what I think Paul is doing through a number of things, he emphasizes the cross of Christ more than anything else. He emphasizes his own suffering a lot when he talks about, especially his ministry with them. There are certain points in the letter where he reminds them of his time with them. And it's interesting that he talks about uh, problematic things about that experience when he does. Uh, and then additionally, through the way that he uh, talks about, I think, the suffering of the Galatians. Um, and that, that all, all, all of this suggests that um, what Paul wants them to, to come away with is that the marks that count ultimately are not the marks of circumcision that identifies this community, but the marks of Jesus. If you look at the very se second to last verse, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, Paul says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And that seems to me to be a kind of um, very climactic way of tying a lot of these threads together to say that these are the marks that, that count, the, the marks that identify us as Jesus followers. And so in this context of suffering and, and persecution that I, that I suggest is uh, part of the situation, uh, they, they ought not to sort of alleviate this pressure by getting circumcised, which is kind of ironic, but to alleviate this pressure by getting circumcised, but rather ought to endure, uh, to endure the turmoil because they're not ultimately called to this to be circumcised, but they're called to follow Christ. And Christ is somebody who, um, uh, who, who ultimately died on the cross. So this idea that uh, they're following a crucified Messiah, that's the, that's the sort of the, ethos, uh, and that, that ought to define the community more than something like circumcision. So that's, that's not as much of an elevator pitch. Uh, I haven't practiced my elevator pitch on this, um, <laughs> but, but um, that's, that's, that's the nuts and bolts, like the real trimmed down version. And um, I partly don't know what I'm stepping into tonight because I don't know uh, how JD set this up last week, and I'm not sure what the next couple of weeks are going to be like. So I really just plan to open up the Bible, and then y'all cut me off when you want me to be done. That's really what I have planned. So I don't know the time that we're meant to be done. Uh, basically just say, and you know, we're done. Uh, and, 7.15? Okay, yeah. So, so we'll get as far as we get. Uh, I, like I said, I, my, my basic thought is we're just going to start with Galatians 1. Um, so if you have your Bibles, um, we're just going to start Galatians 1, chapter 1, and, and, and move forward. I think a, a good thing to say right before we get started, I mentioned that circumcision is kind of the issue. Um, but another thing just to kind of orient us a little bit as, as a letter, as, as, a, as a genre, a, a text, uh, letters are always comprised of at least four basic parts. You start off with the kind of introduction, you list whoever is uh, sending this text, you list who is receiving this text, then you transition typically to Thanksgiving where you say all the things that you love about the recipients of the text, and then you really get into the body of it, 
and then you close it out. Pretty simple. Kind of like with our emails or whatever, we might say like, dear so-and-so and you know, yada, yada, yada. And then I always say cheers at the end of my letters, but people do different things at the end of their letters, right? As a, as a kind of convention of writing an email, there's certain conventions for, for, for writing a letter. The most like uh, sort of average letter size would be something like Philemon in the ancient world. That's the shortest letter from Paul, but that's the most like average letter. Uh, what we have from Paul are just aberrations. Like everything is just massive. Partly, it'd just be too expensive to produce and take so long to write. Uh, Romans, for example, would probably cost like uh, $2,200 to make, and it would take like up to three days to produce, and it's just cumbersome. Most letters are more like Philemon. They're more ad hoc and you know just kind of quick little uh, responses and things. Uh, so Galatians is, is really, really long. It's not the longest thing we have from, from Paul, but as far as the ancient world is concerned, it is, it is quite long. And letters are always in response to a particular situation. Paul never sits down and says, I want to write about X topic. It's always, what's the pastoral situation that I need to address? And this is, like I said, Gentiles being circumcised. That's kind of at the heart of this. But what we're going to notice, uh, especially depending on how far we get, but certainly in chapter 1, is Paul's going to emphatically deny certain things and emphatically address certain things um, that uh, cause us to wonder why exactly? Is it the case that, for example, on the other side, this, in Galatia, are people claiming the opposite? And that's why he needs to double down and stress certain things. We'll see as we go, but it's, it's a curious feature of the letter that he's going to deny a lot of things and he's going to really, really insist. Uh, even he, he swears an oath at one point. Uh, and sort of just, it's curious as to why. So we'll keep that in the back of our minds and I'll, I'll kind of address the specifics of that uh, a little bit um, as, as we go. The other thing about letters is that um, although we say that Paul's the author of this, he's the author of its content, uh, he's not the writer of it. And one of the ways that we know that is if you look at chapter 6, verse 11, uh, Paul, says, Paul says, Behold what large letters I write to you in my own hand. At this point in the letter writing composition, he has literally taken pen in hand and begun to write out the end of the letter. And so although we're not going to talk about the contents of that portion of the letter right now, um, that must stress something about the importance of that content, that there's something really important that he needs to say to finish off, that it was worth him taking literally the pen from his scribe and writing it down himself. Otherwise, Paul wrote by uh, dictation. And, and we know this, we look across his letters, at, towards the end of his letters, if you just kind of like were to peruse real quick, you would see Paul say like, I write this with my own hand, it's the way that I write. Or I write, this is the authentic sign. It's sort of like um, the way you put like a stamp on a letter or something like that. It's a, it's a sign that it's authentically from him. Um, we know from Romans that there, Paul had a particular scribe named Tertius. He identifies himself uh, in Romans 16, 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you. And it, it's, we just, we, know that Galatians is, is uh, also written by a scribe because of this, this thing. So I'd like to say more about chapter 6. I'm not going to, but as you guys progress through, really, uh, I think, uh, focus on that because um, there's, I think, important reasons for why Paul uh, says that, or writes that out with his, own, with his own signature. Okay, let's start. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, so identifying the, the, the sender, right? And here, immediately, we get one of those qualifications that I mentioned. Why does Paul do this? He doesn't do this anywhere else. Not from people, nor through a particular person, but through Jesus Christ, qualifying his apostleship. Why? Is his apostleship being called into question? That's one of the things that could cause us to ask. Is his apostleship being denied? called into question in some way that he has to identify that. Or, as a wrinkle of this, maybe they're not calling his apost apostolicity or whatever into uh, question, but maybe they're saying, oh, you're a second-rate apostle. 
but your apostleship was conferred upon you from, let's say, Peter or something. That's another possibility. Those are, those are, those are some questions we want to keep in mind, because as we go, we'll see more reason to think that as we go. So, uh, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. I always like to point out that that word dead there uh, is plural in, in Greek. And in fact, every time you see in the New Testament, raised from the dead, it's plural. It's never, it's never uh, referring to like a state of being dead. It includes that, of course, to be dead, right? Um, but it's, it's plural. And, and in English, the word dead can be plural too, like the walking dead. Like that's a, a plural use of dead. So, so on Easter, when we say that Jesus was raised from the dead, we probably hear in our, you know, in our head, we probably hear he, he's, he was dead, he's no longer dead. That's true, and that, that's implied. But that's not actually what the phrase means. What the phrase means is that he was among a bunch of dead people, and now he's not. Could be referring to the grave, you know, other corpses. I mean, because that's literally what the Greek means, referring to other dead people, corpses. Um, anyways, he's raised from the dead one. I always like to say dead ones when I, when I get to that. It's raised from the dead ones. Now look at this. And all the brothers and sisters who are with me, those are part of the senders. So Paul, he's one of the senders, and all the brothers and sisters who are with me. This is curious. It's the only time that there's a church that like co-sends with Paul. Sometimes he'll, he'll name like Timothy or Sosthenes or a couple other people. This is the only time where he lists a church as one of the people who are sending it. It's curious. Why? Does that add more authority, more credence? Uh, it's just curious why, why, he, why he lists and why he chooses, chooses to mention them. So, so all, all the brothers and sisters uh, who are with me, uh, to the churches of Galatia. That's the recipient, right? You look at every other letter of Paul. When he identifies the recipient, he always immediately says something really nice about them. He says, he says, like the, the the church of God in Corinth, or he'll say, like the church in Rome, you know, uh, called to be sanctified. You know, like, it's always something really, really nice. This is as bland as it gets. I am strictly naming who I'm sending this to. It's suggestive of things that we're going to see. Paul's not very happy with them, or his relationship is in question. With them. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. Oh, that, do that in other words. That's a good question. So, yeah, we often think of the word the church as like this um, like umbrella term that like refers to like all churches. It's interesting in chapter 1, verse, um, uh, verse 22, he says uh, to the churches. Uh, but I think, is there another reference to singular church? I don't, I don't know. That's a good question, but in verse 22, there is a reference to church as plural. Um, I mean, as opposed to other letters. Like oh. Church in Rome, church in Corinth, churches. Oh, gotcha, in Korea, gotcha. Is that yeah, so, you, so, so, so Paul is, the reason why um, Paul says churches in Galatia is because Galatia is a, a broad geographical region. It's probably, there's a debate about this, it is probably uh, south central Turkey. Asia Minor at the time, but probably South Central Turkey. It's a huge debate about this because some people think it's North Central uh, Turkey. And you might think, well, that doesn't sound super significant uh, in terms of like which region it is, uh, but it actually has um, massive implications for how you compare Paul's writings with Acts because of did Paul, for example, ever get up there? So um, what we know like for, from uh, Acts 13 and 14, this is uh, Paul's first missionary journey. He goes to places like Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. Those places are all in South Central uh, um, uh, Turkey. I would say they're within Galatia. And there's debate about whether, for example, Paul is writing to those churches or not. And that has implications for when this text could be written. Um, there's debate about this. My position is that this is the earliest uh, letter that we have from Paul. This is very debated. So. It, basically, if you, if you don't agree with that, you, you're going to contend that 1 Thessalonians is the earliest letter. It's either of those two. So I, I think it's Galatians, and it's partly because of this issue of where I think Paul's writing to, and then possibly when. Um, I could say more about that, but I'll leave that to the side. But what that, what that means, either Galatians or 1 Thessalonians, not only the first thing that we have from Paul, 
but actually the first Christian product, extant product, obviously other things would have been written, but the first extant Christian document uh, is either 1 Thessalonians or, or Galatians, which is pretty cool, pretty interesting. And in fact, I think that's, that I think sheds a lot of light on why an issue like circumcision would be addressed so forcefully because it hasn't been uh, uh, figured out yet. And, and, and if you know Acts, it gets figured out in chapter 15. This is partly why I think it's, it's, it's written early, and I think it's written to what, what we call South Galatia. It's, it, that's more, there's more to that, but we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. But yeah, good question. And the reason is because it's a geographical area. There are churches in Rome that Paul addresses too, so it's not, it's not, it's not just that uh, the cities are a church and then the region is churches. I think churches in Rome as well, I think he uh, addresses, um, okay. Uh, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, um, and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us or draw us out from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory to the ages of ages. Amen. Now, that is our introduction. Now, right after this, in letter writing, you transition to the Thanksgiving where you say all the great things that you want to say about your recipients. So let's look at verse 6. I marvel. Good job, guys. Hey, that's part of a Thanksgiving, right? Good job, guys. I marvel that you are so quickly turning from the one calling you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. This is like an ironic Rebuke. He's he's saying you y'all have done a great job at being terrible, because the Marvel language is like this. It's impressive. Like I am impressed by this. That you guys are terrible. You know. And it's again. This is where we would expect a Thanksgiving. Paul has swapped the Thanksgiving for an ironic rebuke of his uh, recipients. So you you've turned to this other gospel, and then he's going to quickly qualify. It which is not really another. In other words, there is no other gospel, right? Um, except some, right, are, are troubling you. So we often refer to these um, shadowy figures. So you've got the Galatians, but then we've got these other people who are causing a mess. We often refer to those as like the agitators. Sometimes they're called the Judaizers. That's, that's a problematic term. Uh, but we tend to call them like the agitators. So I, I might... I might call them that. We could call them the troublemakers based upon this verse. There are some who are troubling you and wishing to turn the gospel of Christ, to change it into something else. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a, a, a gospel contrary to, to what we preach to y'all, uh, let him be a curse. As, I told, as we told you before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. Okay, so uh, that's our Thanksgiving section, okay? It's just, yeah, ironic rebuke. Now, as we turn here, uh, this section that follows, Paul's going to do a lot of autobiographical stuff. So this is kind of like the beginning of our body, the body of the letter. Paul's going to do a lot of autobiographical stuff. This is the most autobiographical that Paul gets in his writings. So when we talk about, like, quote-unquote, Paul's conversion, I'll say, I'll say a little bit why... Uh, why I just said quote unquote. Um, but when we talk about Paul's conversion, we often think of like Acts 9. Um, this is the only other like narrative of that uh, sequence uh, of, of events. There's more that he does here than just that, but this includes some of that. But it starts with a lot of these interesting um, comments that just raise all kinds of questions. Like why is Paul saying this? Is there somebody saying the opposite on the other side? We, when we ask that kind of a question, uh, we refer to this as mirror reading. Like, is the text a mirror that sort of shows us the situation? So if someone's really insistent saying, you know, I didn't do this, I didn't do this, uh, is that a mirror that actually shows us, well, people are claiming that? Um, a, a, a terrible example that just popped in my head is when, uh, when Bill Clinton said, you know, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Um, surely he didn't just volunteer that information in the midst of an interview. It's because that is an accusation against him, right? And that's the same sort of thing where it's like, why, why are you insisting on this? 
it just it raises the issue like, oh, somebody must be claiming the opposite. I mean, potentially we have to ask that question. So let's take a look. Uh, verse 10. Uh, so now, for do I persuade people or God? Or do I seek to please people? There's a comment on that. Do I seek to please people? It might be the case. So think about Paul's gospel. It is an anti-circumcision gospel, or at least Gentiles should not be circumcised. That could be regarded as people-pleasing, right? Oh, you've, you've, uh, you've watered down the, the gospel. You've made it real easy. You've made it real pleasing to these men in Galatia. Potentially, right? This is this idea of like, am I a people-pleaser, right? Am I, am I a people-pleaser? It's just interesting that he would say that. Is it because people are saying that's what he is, right? Um, uh, for if I uh, am, am, am persuading people, I would, or I would not be a slave or, or a servant of the Messiah. So that he, he, he's insisting otherwise, right? That he's not, uh, he's not trying to please people. He's trying to please his master is what he's, what he's getting at. Okay, verse 11. For I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel uh, proclaimed by me uh, that it is not according to humans or a person or, or something like that. Um, this, this is very similar to verse 1, where Paul says, I'm an apostle, you know, not, not from people, not through a person, but through Jesus Christ. So now he's you know, mentioning this in relation to his gospel. Is his gospel, you know, man-made or, you know, people-pleasing for the sake of people, right? So that it is human-centered in that, in that way. And, and he's saying, you know, that's not the case. Uh, that's not the case for me, right? Um, it's not according to a person or humanity. Uh, for I did not receive it from a person, okay? I did not receive it from a, a human, a man. I did not receive it from a person, um, uh, or, or nor was I taught it, but through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's, he's pretty clear that the nature of his gospel is something that he received directly from Jesus. He wasn't taught it. So, he, so if there is an accusation that maybe he's secondary, like a second-class apostle, or everything that he knows was conferred to him from, from others, this is meant to cut, cut against that. I wasn't taught this gospel, I received it, right? And it was direct, this, this revelation of Jesus Christ. For you know about my former life. Now, I don't know how your Bibles have it. Um, uh, probably most say in Judaism. Does anybody have anything different? No? Um, so, uh, that, that's, that's uh, not, the best, not the best rendering. Going back to that issue of conversion, so, so the idea of Paul saying, okay, you, you all heard about my former life in Judaism. Uh, Judaism, as, as, that, that's a bit anachronistic. Um, it, it implies, for example, that he's no longer a Jew. And of course he's a Jew. Uh, in fact, um, the, the idea of distinguishing between Christians and Jews does not make sense for uh, any of our New Testament documents, really, truly. It's really not until the end of the first century going into the second century that it's a discernible thing to distinguish the communities. So especially at this point, uh, which, which I would say is late 40. Oh, sorry, I didn't see yeah. it. Yeah, so like when Paul says, like, I received like the gospel taken from Jesus Christ himself, is he kind of saying in a sense, like, now that, now that he's better than the other people who have like been taught it or like received it from men, is he kind of like, I don't know, putting himself above those who have been taught it from men? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think, so um, we, we are definitely trying to make inferences about like, why does he say it the way that he does? And I think that's a pot, certainly a possibility. Is he trying to say that um, my gospel is, is preferable? Um, or, or, or is he just trying to um, disarm the claim that his gospel is secondary? You know, not necessarily mine's better than y'all's, but like, because they received it from Jesus too, right? Yeah. But, but, so maybe what he's trying to say is that um, uh, I also received it from Jesus. It's a different set of circumstances, but I also received it from Jesus. That could be, that could be part of what he's doing. It's, it's hard to know for sure. 
Um, but those are the types of questions that we definitely want to ask, absolutely. And he, he could very well be saying mine's better than y'all's. Um, and, and he actually does uh, uh, call their authority into a question in chapter two, um, which, which I, if we get to it, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that uh, for sure. But yeah, no, that's a great, great question. Um, but on uh, verse 13, so you heard about my former life in Judaism. That, that term Judaism, I think, is, is, uh, is, is, just, is problematic because it implies a distinction between Judaism and Christianity. It suggests that what he's about to say is how he became a Christian. Um, uh, and, and, and what happened, uh, and we'll read about this, he truly had a transformation, right? He was previously doing one thing to, the, to a community that said Jesus was the Messiah, and now he was no longer doing that thing. He had a transformation, absolutely. But is conversion the right term? Uh, and there's a huge debate about whether it is. Obviously, it's a significant transformation. But conversion often implies, I, want, I was in one religion, and now I'm in a different one. And if, if he, as a, as a Jew, had expectations that there would be a Messiah, to, to say, you're the one, you've not converted to anything, right? So, so that, that's, that's one of the problems with that term. Um, so the, 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 the way I would um, translate this is, is um, my life in the Judaizing movement. To Judaize is to have one uh, take on the customs of Judaism, or of the Jewish, Jewish, Jewish customs. What he's about to describe is how ridiculous he was at doing that. So it's not... You heard about my, um, you know, that I was in this other religion. He's talking about a way that he would implement Jewish customs. And he's going to describe how excessive he was in doing that. So uh, uh, carrying on, he says how, um, how excess uh, excessively I persecuted. Oh, here's the, here's the singular church that I was uh, alluding to earlier. How, how excessively I, I persecuted. Uh, the church of God and tried to destroy it. Uh, and I was advanced in this Judaizing movement, probably Judaism is the translation there. Um, I, was, I was advanced in this uh, Judaizing movement, you know, beyond my, uh, many of my contemporaries of my generation, uh, being exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my forefathers. Now, and here's that part that we think of as the conversion part uh, again, it is a legitimate transformation. Um, I, I, I try not to use conversion. We tend to use calling uh, when we talk about this, the calling of Paul, rather than conversion. But just to say that, so verse 15. Um, but when it, uh, it pleased God, the one who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, it's, the sentence doesn't end, so you have to keep going into Actually, it doesn't end until verse, uh, end of verse 17. So I'll, I'll just read the rest of that, but I want to comment on certain things here. So, who called me uh, uh, by his grace to, to uh, uh, reveal his son, I would say, in me. Probably some of your translations have to me. You have in me? Yeah, so I want to comment on that. So um, uh, not, not, not just yet, but, but uh, to reveal his son in me in order that uh, I might proclaim, pr proclaim him among the, the, the nations, the Gentiles, uh, and immediately, so here, here's, this, here's the thing. This is the main verb of this sentence. Immediately, and think about these issues that we were talking about, kind of some of the mirror reading stuff of like, what are people saying about Paul? Immediately, um, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my train. Where did I go? Um, oh, and, and immediately, uh, um, I did not consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem uh, to the ones who were apostles before me, but I departed to Arabia and, uh, and then again went to Damascus. Super interesting. The main verbs of this sentence are, I didn't consult with anybody, I, I, I didn't go up to them, and I went far away. It's really interesting just to see like what's really on his mind. In other words, what, what is he pushing back against, right? So again, he's got this gospel that doesn't come from uh, people, right? And he received it from a revelation, he says. And he's like, y'all remember what I used to be like. 
It was excessive, it was crazy. But then when God was pleased to reveal his son in me, did not go up to anybody, did not consult with anybody. I went, in fact, I went in the opposite direction of Jerusalem. I went far away. Those, those things that he's stressing seems to be in line with the things that we're talking about. I'm not an apostle through people. I'm, I didn't receive my gospel from people. So that, that's the main point of this. Even though there's a lot of cool things packed in verse 15 and 16, the main point is I didn't go to them. I didn't talk to them. I wasn't around them. I was far away from them. But some of the cool things that he says here, um, Paul, in this like autobiog- autobiography here, he uses a lot of imagery from uh, Isaiah 49, uh, especially verses 1 to 6, um, that uh, describe the servant. Uh, one, there's all these servant songs in Isaiah, and there's this servant that verse 6 says is meant to be a light to the nations. And if you look closely at verses 1 to 5, there are a lot of things that the servant says. Uh, one of them, in verse 1, he refers to being, uh, or is it verse 3, uh, being called from uh, his mother's womb. Is it verse 1? Uh, can you read verse 1 for us? Whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Now, in a lot of prophetic uh, calling scenes, there's a lot of scenes like this. Jeremiah has one that's similar. There's, there's language of like being called from the womb, right? But, but this, uh, in, in the Greek of, of Isaiah 49 there, um, it has way more parallels um, that to, to me suggests that Paul's thinking about this verse. In addition, as we proceed, there's gonna be a lot more references back to chapter 49. In other words, Paul imagines himself either as that servant or fulfilling the, um, the, the vocation of that servant to be the light to the nation. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. So it seems like, again, thinking about what, what is Paul doing? He's responding potentially to all these accusations. It seems like he's going back to his calling, going back to, am, am I legit? Uh, how, am, I, am I doing it right? And chapter 49 is, the, of, of Isaiah is this text that is reinforcing his vocation, his calling. And he sees in chapter 49, this description of the servant, he sees what he's meant to do. And in fact, as he describes what he has done, he uses the language of Isaiah 49 to describe what he has done, which is really, really interesting. I'll point out some of the other ones. Um, so if you want to flip back to 49 or stick there, certainly keep a thumb there because uh, I'll point out some other ones. But Paul's going to do this a bunch. Um, and so then, so this idea of being called from his mother's womb, I, I, like I said, I think that's an illusion. I got a yeah. question about Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think of Isaiah and the servant, I think of Jesus. Right. So is it, are there like a couple different servant types in Isaiah? Yeah. So, Paul so, is like, okay, maybe one's Jesus, one's maybe be me. Yep. Yep, yep, great question. So um, I have a whole chapter on that <laughs> in my <laughs> dissertation. Um, the thing is, is actually, if you look at the end of chapter uh, 54 of Isaiah, verse 17, there are multiple plural servants. And um, could talk about why this is the case. This would get us a little too far afield. I'll just say this. Um, I think that the servant of Isaiah is actually the righteous remnant of Israel. So Isaiah is prophesying about exile primarily, talking about those people who... Uh, were faithful in the midst of exile. And I think what the New Testament authors tend to do is they tend to apply that servant concept to Jesus who represents the righteous remnant in exile perfectly and completely. So so I don't, for, so to explain this, I don't think, for example, that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. I think the New Testament authors are like, ultimately, this is about Jesus, if that makes sense. So I think that there are many people who can fulfill the servant's vocation, um, and I think uh, I, I think it. I think Paul is is he certainly sees himself in chapter forty nine, but he does apply chapter fifty three to uh, to Jesus in, in in illusion form, not really in explicit quotation. So in verse four, when we saw that uh, who lo- who lo- uh, who gave himself uh, uh, for our sins, 
Um, similarly, chapter 2, verse 20, where he says, you know, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me, uh, that, that has Isaiah 53 allusions in there. So there are, there are places where I think chapter 53 is applied to, to Jesus, um, but not exclusively, which is interesting, too. Yeah, I could say a lot more about that. It is actually more complicated. Uh, like, 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 I'm just trying to hopefully like say it in a clear way that doesn't take too long. But like, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Um, Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, like I said, just tell me when we're done, because yeah, okay. I, I. Uh, in like ten minutes or fifteen minutes, we'll do like discussion. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll try. I'll try to finish. I'll try to finish the chapter. At least. Yeah, Sorry about that. You're doing great. No, I, I think I cut us short unintentionally. Oh no, that's right. Um, so, so the other thing I want to say about the in me thing. So, he, to, he reveals his son in me. Uh, some translations have to me. The to me. The to me thing uh, suggests you know that what we're dealing with is the external vision, perhaps. The thing is, is there is this motif in Galatians that's fascinating. In fact, maybe I should just run through this real quick. There's this motif in Galatians of, of Paul revealing Christ to the Galatians. So, for example, at the end of chapter 2, right, that's that famous verse where he's like, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. But, but it's not just like, oh, I've been, you know, like, I don't know, like, I'm on team Jesus. It's more than that, right? It's, it's I no longer live, not I, but Christ lives in me, right? Uh, I mentioned this passage at the end of the letter where he says, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Um, in chapter 4, when he's talking about this weakness of the flesh that c really caused him to minister to the Galatians, which is a really interesting thing. I think it's the stoning in Lystra. I think they're connected but um, from, from Acts. But, but he says, it, basically, the reason why I came to y'all is because my flesh was weak. Not in this, um, don't, don't hear more, a moral sense there. Like, literally, I was, I don't know, beat, beat up, sore, like, broken down physically. Um, and that's why I was with y'all. Um, I, it, that, that's what occasioned my visit and the time I spent with y'all. And he says, y'all, when you received me, uh, and he uses an interesting phrase. He says, you didn't, uh, most translations will say uh, despise or reject me. But the Greek word is ektuo, which sounds like what it is. It's to spit. And the idea of spitting at Paul here is, is to say that um, uh, Paul may have had epilepsy, and so you'd spit at somebody who has ep epilepsy. It's a way of keeping the spirits that may have given that person ep epilepsy away from you. It's an apotropaic practice. It's a way of, it's just this way of saying, keep, keep your, your demons away from me. At the very least, it's a way of saying, you may have been cursed by a demon, or you may have been cursed by God, and that's why you're suffering the way that you are. Paul says, y'all didn't spit at me, so you didn't treat me like that, but you received me as an angel, even as Christ Jesus. So again, this connection that Paul is like Jesus. In, in, in their midst. And then my favorite example, and this one, I have to say this one for last to, to connect all these dots, is chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1, uh, Paul says, this is where he says, oh, foolish Galatians. So he's finally, like, turned to address them. He says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your very eyes that Christ Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now think about that for a second. They're in Turkey, whether it's north or south, they're in Turkey. They did not see Jesus crucified, literally. So what in the world could Paul be referring to? Some have thought, oh, Paul's preaching was like so vivid that um, it's like they could see Jesus in his teaching. Some have thought uh, maybe he like literally had like posters and he like drew on them or something. And some were like, um, you know, maybe he acted it out like this is a miming reference. Um, I think in light of everything that we've seen, what he's saying is, when you looked at me in my weakness and it, with the marks on my body, you saw Jesus. You saw Jesus crucified when I was with y'all. I think that's what he's saying. And this is the verse that comes right after him saying, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I, Christ lives in me. You know, Right after he says that, he says, y'all saw Christ crucified. I just think that's what he's talking about. So going back to this revealed in me as opposed to to me, to me is this kind of external revelation. It's the in me, I think. It's this idea of, of uh, through Paul, God is going to reveal his son to the nations. That's what I think he's getting at there in verse 16. Um, 
it could be it could be translated either way. So it's not a matter of like good or bad translation. Uh, it's a matter of like thematic connections. I think it's m much more on target with what he's talking about throughout Galatians to say revealed in me uh, as opposed to, to to me. So, okay, so then in verse 17, he's like, you know, I didn't go up, I didn't do any of this stuff. Notice how he, as it goes from here, he's going to stress how, uh, how few of the apostles he connected with and how little time he spent with them. Again, keep, keeping with the thread of verse 17. So verse, verse 18, uh, then after three years, okay, I was away from them for a long time. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to meet Cephas, so that's Peter, uh, and stayed with him for 15 days. That's it. And then, this is interesting, but of the other apostles, I don't know except James, the brother of the Lord. That's it. Now, verse 20, this is where he swears an oath. What I write to y'all, Behold, in the presence of God, that I do not lie. He, he is swearing an oath right now. That's how serious this is. So, so we might just think, like, why is his travel log something that he needs to say I'm not lying about? If we connect some of these dots with the apostleship stuff and, like, where's his gospel from, he, he seems to be emphatically asserting that I didn't spend much time with them, so I couldn't have had it taught to me from them. I, I couldn't be an apostle based upon their teaching or, their, or whatever, uh, because I barely got to know them. You know, that's what he's stressing, and I'm not lying, right? And then verse uh, verse 21 to 24, he's going to uh, say more about um, those churches in, in Judea uh, who did know about him. So, so then I went up to the, the, the villages or the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So again, uh, carrying this idea, I didn't spend much time with them. I didn't really even get to know more than two of them. And actually, I was, I was in Syria, so north of Israel, and Cilicia, so the so south, south central Turkey. I was far away. I wasn't even around them. Um, uh, being unknown literally to the face, I, I was not known to the churches of, uh, of, of Judea who are in Christ. So, so again, if he had been spending a lot of time there, if he was a disciple of Peter or whatever, then pe the people in those churches would have known who he was. But he's like, they didn't know my faith. Literally, this is what Greek says. They didn't know my faith, um, the churches of Judea who are in Christ. Um, but only they were hearing that the one persecuting us at one time now preaches the faith which he tried to destroy. And they glorified God uh, on my behalf. That, that, that verse, uh, they glorified God on my behalf. Um, Isaiah 49, verse 3. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. Yeah, so there's this thread. So I'll just point out some more of the thread. Look at verse 2. Um, so in, 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 cha in chapter 2, uh, he's going to talk about his time in Jerusalem. And this is going back to your, uh, sorry, what's your name? Uh, Jimmy. Jimmy. Going back to your point about like, is he trying to one-up them? He's going to make reference to them. It's more clear in the Greek, but he's going to make references to them where he's going to say, those who seem to be pillars, those who seem to be something, he says at one point. In other words, it's like, you're talking about like the most important apostles, and you're saying, those who seem to be important. It's just, curious, it's just a real curious reference that going back to your point, it could fit into what you're, what you're asking about. Um, but I want to connect some of these Isaiah 49 dots really quick. Um, so in, 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 in uh, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I went up because of a revelation. So again, he's claiming, like, why did I go to Jerusalem? It was like, God told me to here. Curious in light of everything that we're talking about. It's like, I only went up because I had to, in other words. Um, and, uh, and laid before them the gospel that I preach among the nations, uh, according to those who seem to be something. That's, the, that's that reference, to those who seem to be something. I don't know how all your translations render this, but um, does it say something like that? Those who seemed, those who seemed in something along those lines? Right, like those who seemed as leaders? Ah, that, 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 makes, it, that makes it more positive. Uh, those esteemed. So really, he's saying those who like you, you, you think they're important. Like it seems like they're important. You know, um, uh, 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 
lest uh, I, uh, I was running in vain or had run in vain. Uh, take a look at Isaiah 49, verse 4. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. Yeah, so he is now telling them, hey, here's what I preach among the nations to make sure that I hadn't been running in vain. And this language of exerting effort in vain, right out of Isaiah 49, uh, verse 4. So then think about, you know, 49, verse 6, this light to the nations. He doesn't cite it here, but it's, it is just really curious. It, it's suggestive that, again, it seems like Isaiah 49 is on his mind. His, uh, you know, his vocation, his calling is, has been called into question, it seems. And um, he seems like he wants to uh, defend that. So I don't know if that brings us up to the time that you said you wanted to cut us off. We've got five, five more minutes, and then we can discuss. Oh. Or, or if now's a good time to discuss. Well, yeah, I, yeah, because I don't know how much further we can really get into chapter ten. Um, so I think I think that's a good. I, I'm sorry, I meant chapter two. I was thinking up to verse ten. I was like, could we get to verse ten? And I don't know that we can. So we we just turned to discussion. Yeah. For sure. I think I was tasked with speaking about chapter two as well. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but um, I mean, I could quickly say what I think is going on in chapter two, but. Feel free. Well, so the, the autobiography in some ways doesn't end until the end of chapter two, uh, but it's not apparent, it's not immediately clear that that's the case. So the first 10 verses of chapter 2 is when he's going to talk about his time in Jerusalem with those who seem to be pillars. So he, he does do some digs with them, I think. But he's going to basically say, like, um, they didn't add anything to my gospel. If you look at verse 10, he says, only that I, uh, in order that we might remember the poor, which I was very eager to do this thing. In other words, I was already doing it. They didn't add anything to me except that I should remember the poor, but I was already doing the thing that they told me I should be doing. So they did not, you know, my, my, my ministry is not qualified by their input. Like, he just seems to be addressing this uh, pretty clearly. Um, and then in verses 11 to 14, we might take that as a discrete unit. He's going to talk about this time in Antioch. So we're in, we're, we're, we're in South Central Turkey. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about this time in Antioch when Peter's eating with these Gentiles and some people from James show up and, and uh, Peter withdraws. And Paul calls him out for this. He confronts him. We never get the aftermath of this story. So it's really curious why Paul doesn't report, for example, like Peter repenting or Peter saying, I'm sorry, or, or reconciliation between the church. It could suggest that that didn't happen. That actually, sort of, it's sort of like, now this, this could be wrong. So the, it's, it's, a, it's a question of mirror reading. We don't know what happened because we, he doesn't tell us. But it could, you know how like, um, what's a good example? I'll just make some up. Uh, but like, if, um, if you like were in class and your teacher said something and you disagreed with them, you might tell your friends like, oh, and I said X, Y, and Z. And it could, be, it could sound like nice and vindicating because you said it, right? But like, what if your teacher shut you down, <laughs> but you didn't report that part? You just want to be known as the person who said it. You know what I mean? So it's just curious, like, we don't get the rest of what happened. Um, it does lead some people to think that, that maybe Paul didn't win the day. Like, actually, maybe everybody sided with Peter. And so what Paul, Paul's just reporting that he opposed them. Um, but, but uh, yeah, we don't, we, we don't know. It's interesting, if you look at patristic commentaries on this passage, they, they claim that this was staged, because uh, they don't like the idea of apostles you know, being in conflict. So they claim that this was staged, so that uh, Peter and Paul like, acted out this thing to like, teach a lesson to them. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's just because they're uncomfortable right, with the idea of Peter and Paul like, having a row. Um, but I think it further reinforces that his, his apostleship is not dependent on this guy, right? Um, and, uh, but what's really important, I, I, what I really want to say about this is that we might treat verses one, uh, 11 to 14 as a discrete unit. Like, here's what happened in Antioch. I opposed Peter. And then we tend to treat verses 15 to 21 as like a separate kind of transitional, perhaps even like a separate, like, let me just 
teach the Galatians about justification by faith for a second. What we have in verses 15 to 21 is what Paul is telling us that he said to Peter. So everything that he says about justification by faith in there, which we kind of abstract and treat as like just a doctrine that's kind of hanging in the clouds, but this is something that Paul is saying to Peter at a dinner table. In light of him withdrawing from eating with Gentiles, he's saying we're justified by our faith, not by works of the law, and it's important that we keep that phrase of the law. We often tend to think that those works are just like general good deeds, but it's works that come from the law, works that are prescribed by the law. And again, this is a Jewish context in which we're curious about how do Gentiles relate to it. So we're justified by our faith, not by observing the law in a particular way. And in that context, Paul's confronting Peter, and so we have to keep that in mind, that he's at a dinner table saying this stuff. It's not an abstract con set of concepts. This is Gentiles and Jews ought to be able to eat together. That's justific justification by faith in this passage, the very applied uh, you know, idea. Uh, in this passage, we can eat together because of justification by faith. You know? Obviously, it's, it's justification by faith is bigger than that, but in this context, because everything's pastoral, this is what he's you know, commenting on. Okay, I'll stop with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so yeah. much. And I don't, um, there doesn't have to be a discussion on the other side if anyone has a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, why not, so. Yeah. Um, concerning the qualifications of apostles, I've been taught that it was a qualification to be like a head apostle that you had seen Jesus yourself face right. to face. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and of course, according to that um, idea, you know, Paul is saying, I saw Jesus, right? So, like, so like um, certainly he would fit that. But you can just imagine, like, put, put yourselves in, uh, uh, in the shoes of Peter and James and John and all those other guys. Like, who is this dude who's saying he can go hang out with Gentiles now? I'm sorry, what? I mean, like, just imagine how strange this is. Like, Paul, Paul, to me, part, I mean, the reason why I did my PhD on this is because I think he's the most curious person, in, like, in history. Like, he's fascinating. Like, who in the world just does this? Like, you know, like, immediately, like, turns face and starts uh, preaching this message uh, when there are other people who are, like, uh, no, we were hanging with Jesus, and we don't do it this way. Like, that's just, it's, it's just, it's, it's super fascinating and super curious. But Paul is saying, I fit that bill, that, that criterion, you know. I was around, I wasn't around from the beginning, but I did see him, you yeah. know. Isn't that the way Jesus works? Oh, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like how, if he didn't give Peter the original, you mm. know, Right. Him right. As, like the head of the church. Yeah. Or whatever. But that, like, he gave it to this persecutor of the church. This message that they had to have humility to receive right. that from him. Right. Yeah. No, it is amazing. You're right. It's interesting for me to think of Paul and Peter going at it because, like, Peter's like this fisherman who's like been with the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Paul is like this super smart dude. Like that, yeah. Like that. That, that is true. Yeah, to think about the the difference along those lines. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. A, a comment to make just about the, the the Peter of it all too is we might think that there's a discrepancy here with Acts uh, because in Acts, you know, um, Peter receives this vision. You know, rise, kill, and eat. He sees all these unclean animals. He gets this vision, rise, kill, and eat. Some are thinking, well, wait, wait, wait. Why isn't he, like, you know, eating with these Gentiles? Um, I think that, uh, you know, these are early days. Things are getting sussed out. But what, what Peter's doing is he's responding um, to the fact that there are these Jews who have just arrived, these men from James, who uh, he is concerned about what they might think 
about him eating with Gentiles. And it, it's not what he's eating. It's actually that he's eating with Gentiles. So even with the Acts example, um, at Peter never changed his diet. And that's not the meaning of the vision. It seems like it should be, right? Like, rise, kill, and eat. Have a barbecue, right? Like, that seems like that's the point of it. But right, if, you look at the, if you look at it, Peter doesn't understand what the vision means. We should think it's super straightforward, quite straightforward. But Peter's like, I don't get it. I don't get what, what it means. And then Cornelius, this Gentile centurion, shows up and a bunch of his entourage. And Peter realizes that, oh, I should accept these people. And he preaches and the Spirit falls upon them. And Peter realizes that it's not that I need to change my diet, it's that I need to accept the people who eat those creatures. That's, that's what's important. And, and, and so, um, so we, one way to think about this is like um, what we call a speech act theory. So you can say something, uh, and that we would call a locution. Sorry for the fancy words. A, a locution, simply like a statement. So like an example of this would be like, um, are you really going to wear that out of the house? At the locutionary level, the, the, the locution itself is a question about clothing. The next thing is what we call illocution, which is what you're doing with what you're saying. Because you're not really asking a question if that's what they're going to wear. Obviously, they're wearing it. You are trying to do something in particular. You're trying to cause them to rethink. And the perlocutionary, which is the next thing, what you want to happen, you want them to change their clothes. Right? So speech act theory is, is this concept that's really important about distinct, not just what is said, but like what you're doing with what you're saying and what you want to happen. So rise, kill, and eat at the locutionary level, have a barbecue. But that's, that's not actually Peter, P, P, not like Peter knew speech act theory, but, but he clearly didn't think that the locution was uh, straightforward. Like he thought there was something deeper. Uh, and the, the illocution, what God's doing with this is causing Peter, and what he wants Peter to do is to receive the Gentiles who eat those creatures. Um, so I think Peter, uh, yeah, Peter doesn't change his diet. He remains a Jew in that, in, that, in that way. He doesn't change his diet, but he does start to eat with Gentiles, which is what we see here even in Antioch. It's just in that moment of weakness or whatever, he was just afraid about what, cert what certain people that he normally hangs out with would think about, about this. Because there are you know, strict laws about these sorts of things. You don't want to be ritually impure by eating with people who are impure. Because you know? then you can't go to the temple, and yeah, there's, imp there's ramifications for that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, John. Yep, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Did I actually start it off? I thought JD started off last week. Well, we, this was our first teaching night. Oh. We did have like a, um, one of our Sundays be like the introduction. So oh, I guess, okay. yeah, I guess we started with okay. like an overview. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Instead of like starting in chapter one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, cool. Um, would you mind saying a prayer just yeah. to close us to yeah. pray for our study? Brilliant, brilliant. That's great. Dylan, so, thank you so much for uh, this time that we have to study your word and for everybody here. Um, pray that uh, um, as, as we think about uh, this text more throughout the next couple of weeks, that uh, you bless, bless the study, that um, uh, you would glean uh, what you have to say through, through Paul um, as, as we continue to study this, and uh, pray that uh, you'd be glorified in that, and that we would uh, be able to uh, apply this to our lives and live it out in our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Cheers. John, I'm curious what you make.